Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Welcome to Politics Done Right from the studios of KPFT 90.1 FM Houston, your community radio station. We have a great program for you today. Marlon Weems is with us again. We're going to talk about the deception of Build Back Better. The squad knew it. Progressives knew it. They just hoped America saw it. Marlon Weems, also known on, on as the Greek trader on Twitter, talks about Build Back Better deception and all of the ridiculous statements they've made about it. He's a former real uh, trader on Wall Street, and he sees the light. He understands what is actually going on in the world right now. Well, we also have a alert. Patent-free COVID vaccine from Texas proves that innovation does not require us to steal from Americans in order to get innovation active. It's not required. Then, of course, Chuck Todd once again allowed somebody from the GOP to come on and somehow equate that the insurrection, while not exactly like uh, uh, like BLM activities or something, they're, they're kind of similar. In other words, the right wing are trying to take us to the extremes, but the left is also doing the same thing with all these false equivalences. We put that baby to rest. Then, of course, there's a governor of Rhode Island, Republican, should be respected. He comes out and he let Republicans have it. What's wrong with the sycophants? He made it clear that they're not all the same, though the majority are now aligned with the terrorist president of the past. Well, you know where we go. But this morning, Joe Biden Joe Biden came out and he did what is what he should have done a long time ago. It's it's been missing for so long. He really took it to the president. He dissected the three lies. The lie about the insurrection really being in November, the real day of the election. He lied about the vote count. He lied about just about everything and he dissects all three of them perfectly. So we have a great show folks. I want you to stick around, stick around for the whole thing and make sure to keep this station alive by doing, you know what, kpft.org. Visit us at kpft.org. You can get any one of my books as a gift for becoming a member of KPFT. Go to kpft.org, click that donate button, select Politics Done Right as the show you're supporting and go into the gift area and select As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right Wing Doom, or you can also get It's Worth It, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors, or go to How to Make America Utopia, Take Away the Economy from Those Who Rigged It. If you get one book, it gives you one particular membership price. Two books, you get a discount, and three books, you get an even better discount. So please consider becoming a member of KPFT, and in the process, you get the gifts of the books. You can get Politics Done Right Mondays through Fridays on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash politics done right. On YouTube Live at politics done right.com slash YouTube. Please do not forget to follow me on Twitter for updates. My handle is at Egberto Willis at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. Before you get started, please remember to keep your community radio station in your minds, KPFT in your minds. Talk about it. Tell your friends about it. Tell them you know about this station in town, 90.1 FM Houston, that needs your support, that is there to provide what? That nour- nourishment that we need. 713 526 5738. 
kpft.org. Visit us online. Contribute online. KPFT 90.1 FM. You can visit us at kpft.org. You guys, you know what time it is. Let's get busy. It's the new year, but you know, sometimes things just continue the same way over and over again. I want you to listen to this interview that Chuck, well, it's a snippet of the interview between Chuck Todd and Congressman Mayor of Michigan. And this is important because believe it or not, when you create this type of narrative, it gives others the the, the reason, it gives others the rationale to do wrong. Check this out. We'll take it on the other side. Legitimize our democracy. Does that concern you? Does that do you share that uh, fear and view? I do, uh, but I also see another party that's trying to delegitimize our democracy in far less dramatic ways. Uh, at least, you know, not guys with Viking hats, you know, bare chested running into the Capitol, but calling for packing the Supreme Court, calling for abolishing the Senate, and frankly, doing the same thing, the same justifications that I saw uh, from some members of my party after the riots last summer. They say, well, why is it so bad that we stormed the Capitol? You know, they were the ones burning down these cities, the sense of riot envy. Now we have this delegitimization envy, mm. where again, it is creating a reciprocal reaction. I think this is all incredibly dangerous. I think the threat of violence is probably more pronounced on the right today, but that does not mean the left is not capable as well. And that is what we need to cease. We need to cease this opportunity that has been grabbed at to expand the field of contest in the mm. field of play, where instead of working within institutions, we seek to destroy and delegitimize the institutions themselves. Can the Republican Party survive uh, Donald Trump becoming the nominee one more time? Well, if by survive you mean win elections, um, yeah. I think they can. Uh, if by survive you mean offering a cohesive governing ideology, some modicum of alliance to principles, I think that's something that's going to be a larger project. I mean, and notice, uh, after he made those accusations or those those false equivalences, Chuck Todd just wait, went into another mode. Do you think Donald Trump could still uh, win? Every, every, let, let's 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 first clear things up. Uh, the January 6th in, in, insurrectionists attempted to overthrow the United States government. They attempted a violent coup. He then equated that to BLM protests, wanting to make the Senate more fear, mean it fair, meaning not little states being able to control the whole agenda of the country. And thirdly, a Supreme Court that where many of the Democratic choices were stolen by the Republicans. In other words, they stole several seats from Democrats. Punto y final. There are no arguments about that. So what he's trying to equate, a, an attempted coup with a logical coup that the Republicans have already effected on America, that said that most senators from small states block what most Americans want, that is a soft coup. That Mitch McConnell and Republicans were able to stuff, pack the Supreme Court with, with, with uh, justices that were undeserving, justices whose time had not come, justices they had no right to appoint given that there was a Democratic president to appoint, that is a soft coup. That we have a protest in the streets and you attempt to make a protest on, on the streets for the necessity of having equal justice under the law in this country, by wanting to equate that with others is completely unfair. So again, the Republicans have already effected two soft coups and injustice on the people. And somehow, Chuck Todd allows it to pass by this confused Republican congressman stating, well, you know, it's it's bad. January 6th is bad. You know, it, they, they want to delegitimize institutions. But let's not give Democrats a pass because they want to do it as well. They want to make the Senate more fair. That's not good. They want to make the Supreme Court more fair. That's not good. And they don't want they don't want any protest. They want to create protests because we want to continue harming people of color. We want to continue harming the poor. So if they want to mitigate all those things, we can understand why others want to coup. I mean, Chuck Todd was handed on a platter, a way to dispel 
the false equivalences that is that is all over this country that gives these people the, the belief that what they're doing is right. And did he do it? No. He just moved on and said, could, Trump, could Donald Trump win another race? To which this, the congressman justifiably says, and is correct, based on the undemocratic nature of America, based on a, an electoral college, based on, an, on unfair redistricting policies, yes, Donald Trump, if we don't have an, a, a, a huge win for Democrats and progressives in 22 and 24, yes, Donald Trump and the fascist could be president again. Let me get to the story. The first one I want to do is, it, it happened right here in Texas. And I want you guys to, to read this story with me. Let me put it on the screen. Ahí está, mis amigos. I love Peter Hortes. You know, you, you see him on, on MSNBC all of the times. But I always liked him for his honesty, uh, for how he portrayed but I want to read you this. Texas team applauded for given what Big Pharma refuses, a patent-free vaccine to the world, developed here in red country, in, at Baylor, here in Texas. I don't know if it's at Baylor, it's one of the medical center's places. Let's read. We're not trying to make money, we just want to see people get vaccinated. A small team of Texas researchers is being hailed for developing an unpatented COVID-19 vaccine to share with the world without personal profit and some advocates asking if they can do it, this small company can do it, why can't Big Pharma as well? Dubbed the world's COVID vaccine, the inoculation formerly called Cobervax is an open source alternative to Big Pharma's patent protected vaccines. Instead of being produced for profit, that shot could ultimately be manufactured around the world and made cheaply available to all without governmental or private legal retribution. Common Dreams reported this week that Cobervax developed jointly by Texas Children's Hospital, Houston Baylor's College, and the Indian pharmaceutical company Biological E Limited was authorized for emergency use in India amid a surge in infections driven by the highly contagious Omicron variant. Texas Children's Hospital says the new vaccine is at least 90% effective against the SARS-CoV-2 virus and 80% or more effective against the Delta variant. We're not trying to make money, Peter Hotes, who led the Texas Children's Hospital team, told the Washington Post. We just want to see people vaccinated. This is big. You hear me rail against uh, the, the evils of unfettered capitalism, the evil of what Milton Friedman did when Milton Friedman says, executives of companies, you have no, absolutely no moral responsibility to people. Your only responsibility is to the shareholder. You are there to uphold shareholder value, nothing else. And we got the Moderna vaccine, we got the, all these other vaccines developed. And by the way, they were not developed just by these private companies. They don't take risks. These vaccines had their genesis. The mRNA vaccines had their genesis with your money, with the money from the taxpayer. That's where it started. Private sector don't take risks. They don't. Don't let them fool you with all that crap about if we don't charge these exorbitant fees for drug prices that somehow innovation will end. Dr. Hotes proves that otherwise. You know, I, I'm an engineer. Um, uh, Bruce is a, a scientist. Uh, Norman is an engineer. I, I, and I have other engineers and scientists and other folks in the house right now, on our screen right now. We don't innovate to get a billion dollars. We don't innovate because we want to get filthy rich. We innovate because we innovate. We see some, when I stayed up at three, there, my, my wife could tell you, for, for, for over 10 years, I probably got three hours of sleep on average a day 
developing Calm DRV, the product that I, my product. And it wasn't because I thought I was going to get rich. It was because I loved it. I loved innovating. Yes, it's going to pay the bills. And eventually I said, yes, eventually it'll get us a house, etc., etc., etc. But engineers, doctors, good doctors, not the ones that are in it for profit only. Engineers, scientists, we love to innovate. That is why an atomic bomb could have been created in Brazil, in China, in, 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 in Russia, and all these places. Even though they have different systems. Communists, capitalists, socialists, all these different systems. Innovators innovate. It's a, but in a capitalist system, we take advantage of everybody to make those who create nothing wealthy. And when I say create nothing, that's what I mean. People say, oh, but look at El Senor Elon Musk. He's so smart. Elon Musk, of course, is smart. I don't want to take away anything from Elon Musk. I don't want to take away anything from Jeff Bezos. I don't want to take away anything from, from Bill Gates. They are all, if, they, if you take an IQ based on an American IQ, their IQ is better than a lot of people, but it's not the best. There are a lot of people with higher IQs who work for them, and they are the ones who innovate. And they didn't say, I need to have billions to innovate. They said, I just want to create. I love creating. That's it. So the lie is that somehow we need to pilfer the American people in order for us to create something. I want, I, I'm going to try to get Hortis on the show. I am going to, you know, it, it's interesting because I got the, I got, when the guy in New York, his counterpart in New York wrote a book, his, his publicist sent us the stuff to interview. And I wasn't particularly interested in that one. I wanted, I knew Hortis was working on something, but I didn't know Hortis was coming out patent free. I want to, if, if I could find this guy and just give him a big hug and just say, you are, you made my point, brother. You made my point. You made my point. You made not my point. You made our points because that's how we feel. I know even Lee Grant, my brother conservative, feels that way. So that is where we're at. That is where we're at. Let me get to some a few messages, then I'm going to go do my ass. So let's get back. I, I left you guys for a while. Paravet, 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 paravet. Okay, coming on. We have Puffin says, good on them for making open source vaccination. Paul Fleming says, this would be the ultimate win for the world. January 6th, the day that we live in infamy, just like Pearl Harbor and all the other times when America as a country was tested. And the president recently gave an address. And the most important part of the address, I hope people take note of, it is the explanation, the, bro the breakdown of the three lies and making sure that people understand exactly why they are what they are. So let's take a listen to that and then take it on the other side. Because we have a shared belief in democracy then anything is possible, anything. And so at this moment, we must decide what kind of nation are we going to be? Are we going to be a nation that accepts political violence as a norm? Are we going to be a nation where we allow partisan election officials to overturn the legally expressed will of the people? Are we going to be a nation that lives not by the light of the truth, in the shadow of lies. We cannot allow ourselves to be that kind of nation. The way forward is to recognize the truth, to live by it. The big lie being told by the former president and many Republicans who fear his wrath is that the insurrection in this country actually took place on Election Day, November 3rd, 2020. Think about that. Is that what you thought? Is that what you thought when you voted that day? Taking part in an insurrection? Is that what you thought you were doing? Or did you think you were carrying out your highest duty as a citizen and voting? Former presidential supporters are trying to rewrite history. 
They want you to see Election Day as the day of insurrection. And the riot that took place here on January 6th as a true expression of the will of the people. Can you think of a more twisted way to look at this country, to look at America? I cannot. Here's the truth. The election of 2020 was the greatest demonstration of democracy in the history of this country. More of you voted in that election than have ever voted in all of American history. Over 150 million Americans went to the polls and voted that day. In a pandemic, some at great, great risk to their lives. They should be applauded, not attacked. Right now, in state after state, new laws are being written. Not to protect the vote, but to deny it. Not only to suppress the vote, but to subvert it. Not to strengthen and protect our democracy, but because the former president lost, instead of looking at the election results from 2020 and saying they need new ideas or better ideas to win more votes, the former president and his supporters have decided the only way for them to win is to suppress your vote and subvert our elections. It's wrong. It's undemocratic. And frankly, it's un-American. The second big lie being told by the former president's supporters is that the results of the election of 2020 can't be trusted. The truth is that no election, no election in American history has been more closely scrutinized or more carefully counted. Every legal challenge questioning the results in every court in this country that could have been made, was made, and was rejected, often rejected by Republican-appointed judges, including judges appointed by the former president himself, from state courts to the United States Supreme Court. Recounts were undertaken in state after state. Georgia. Georgia counted its results three times with one recount by hand. Phony partisan audits were undertaken long after the election in several states. None changed the results. And in some of them, the irony is the margin of victory actually grew slightly. So let's speak plainly about what happened in 2020. Even before the first ballot was cast, the former president was preemptively sowing doubt about the election results. <clears throat> he built his lie over months. It wasn't based on any facts. He was just looking for an excuse, a pretext to cover for the truth. He's not just a former president. He's a defeated former president. Defeated by a margin of over 7 million of your votes in a full and free and fair election. There is simply zero proof the election results are inaccurate. In fact, in every venue where evidence had to be produced, an oath to tell the truth had to be taken, the former president failed to make his case. Just think about this. The former president and his supporters have never been able to explain how they accept as accurate the other election results that took place on November 3rd. The elections for governor, United States Senate, House of Representatives. Elections which they closed the gap in the House. They challenged none of that. President's name was first. Then we went down the line. Governors, senators, House of Representatives. Somehow those results are accurate on the same ballot. But the presidential race was flawed. And on the same ballot, the same day, cast by the same voters, the only difference, the former president didn't lose those races. He just lost the one that was his own. Finally, the third big lie being told by a former president and his supporters is that the mob who sought to impose their will through violence 
are the nation's true patriots. Is that what you thought when you looked at the mob ransacking the Capitol, destroying property, literally defecating in the hallways, rifling through the desks of senators and representatives, hunting down members of Congress? Patriots? Not in my view. Biden, for the first time in his presidency and pre-presidency, he is actually taking on Donald Trump as he should. He's taking on Donald Trump's sycophants as he should. He gave no waiver. And there's something I've been hoping that these people would say for a long time. Look, the, dis the disparity between the vote count, 7 million people, the largest voting margin in a very long time should have been enough to say no matter what little intricacies you find that the president of the United States, the people, the, the person most people wanted was Joe Biden by over 7 million votes. But it's, it's, it's more than that, right? Uh, in every respect, the, 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 the state courts, the federal courts, the different boards found that they could not find any voter fraud and the voter fraud that they found those that that fraud was trump sycophants trying to vote multiple times for him that's what they found so far and still to date they are fooling their constituents that somehow there was a lie in this particular election that somehow the election was fraudulent and then using that as an excuse to turn a less than democracy into a complete fascist state. Let's not buy into it. Let's keep on talking to those of us, to those on, on our right. Keep talking to them. Eventually something will sink into some. The sycophants you can't do anything about. But again, Biden with this, this uh, particular speech, finally out of his own mouth, the excoriation needed, not only on Trump's sycophant, but Trump, the evil man himself, occurred. Maintaining our democracy will not be easy. If we are to do it, it's going to, re it's going to require that people on all sides, including Republicans, take a stance. And guess what? We have some Republican governors that are doing just that. Check this out and then we'll take it on the other side. Last year's attack on the Capitol has done little to distance the majority of the Republican Party from the former president. But there are a small number who speak out denouncing the attack and those who instigated it. One of those Republicans is Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland, and he is here with me now. Thank you so much for joining me. Happy New Year to you. Uh, let's start with what Happy polls are showing uh, about Republican voters. They overwhelmingly believe the election lies that fueled the Capitol attack and Republican candidates across the country are playing into the, that belief and trying to win primaries that way. So can American democracy survive when these lies have been become so deeply ingrained in your party? Well, it's a great question, Dan. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I continue to speak up and, and tell the truth about you know what happened, because I think it's uh, it's critically important. I mean, it's it's frankly, it's crazy that uh, that many uh, people believe that, uh, uh, you know, things that just simply aren't true, that they believe a, a, a different version of reality. But look, let's face it, there's been an amazing amount of uh, disinformation that's been spread over the past year. And and many people are consuming that disinformation and believing it as if it's fact uh, to, to think that uh, the violent uh, protesters who uh, who attacked the Capitol are uh, our seat of democracy on January 6th was just tourists, you know, looking at statues. It's insane that anyone could watch that on television and believe that's what happened. We spent and that is what we're going to need a lot of. We're going to need a lot of people coming out and doing exactly what the governor just did. I think he should be commended. He's going to take a lot of flack for it, but it doesn't really matter. Anybody who cares about the country would actually see exactly what he did. But you know what? It's one of the wonderful things that I see out of this interview. She actually used the word lie that in effect, and I don't know if you remember for, for decades, they wouldn't use the word lie. Well, they're using the words lie now successfully. Successfully, let's hope it's just not too late. Let's hope we can save what is left. Today we have a repeat guest. 
Marlon Weems, a.k.a. The Journeyman at uh, Medium.com, a man who spent 30 years in finance, 10 of those on Wall Street. Global investment banks subsequently hired him to help them decipher developments in the financial and social economic landscape. Marlon points out that mainstream news rarely drills down enough to give a true picture of what's happening, let alone it all means that henceforth, the need for writers like the journeyman is of utmost importance at this time. I am honored once again, Marlon <laughs> Weems. Welcome to Politics Done Right. Hello again. Thanks for having me, Egberto. Well, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you, and I've been wanting to talk to you for several weeks now, but with the holidays and so forth, it was a little bit difficult to get all the things scheduled appropriately. Now, you... Um, you worked in finance. You you worked in the bowels of capitalism, where uh, where our work and worth has been traded in the form of stocks. Um, Build back better is not complete. Build back better. The policies that progressives and the president have been attempting to pass has a lot needed, but it offered quite a bit. Many thought that we had an agreement that if we gave people that hardware, that capital within the hard infrastructure <laughs> that we are speaking about, that somehow we would have people say, you know what, we've been given capital for so long. Why not at this time look at humans as capital need and tender as well? Please tell me your thoughts on that. I'm going, I'm going to um, probably date myself age-wise a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I grew up um, reading uh, Charlie Brown and, you know, the classic um, uh, scene is Lucy with the football mm -hmm. and you could see this coming a mile away. And I have to say, I really um, up until now have been, if not a fan of Nancy Pelosi in terms of strategy and you know, sort of getting it right. This was one that I was really surprised to see her um, uh, maybe, you know, just sort of have a misstep because you could just see that there's, I mean, we point at Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema over in the Senate, but, you know, there's that little group of what are called moderate Democrats. You know, it's a, to me a, a loose term, but, um, this was going to happen from the beginning. And, and I think that by and large, the progressives knew that. Um, but when the president comes to you and says, you know, I got this, you, you know, you got to listen to the president, I think. And so I understood why, um, you know, they didn't just block the bills because think about it, had they shut everything down in the house, then, you know, all the guns would have been turned on the squad and and so forth. So, you know, they tried to go the party line and look where we are. And it's to me, it's really sad. I, I mean, because there was a lot. Um, just think of where we would be right now had that passed. You know, a few weeks ago, I, I just think the trajectory for Democrats in the midterms would be a whole lot different. And um, you know, I, I got a lot of feelings about this. I was very disappointed. Let very me ask you in this way, because, you know, um, I am tired of blaming Republicans. Republicans are going to do what Republicans do, period. Mm -hmm. uh, they care nothing more than about capital. You know, now my contention is that the Democratic Party, yes, it's where progressives reside right now, but that too often there are enough tentacles from the plutocracy, from the oligarchy, from the corporatocracy in the Democratic Party, meaning the mansions, meaning the even even the secret, the senator from California. Why? Uh, 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 what's her name? Weinstein. Not, I forgot her name. No, no. Diane Feinstein. Diane Feinstein. Oh, Feinstein. Even Feinstein, even even with her not wanting to get rid of the sure. filibuster and protecting the flanks of the corporatocracy. We do have some as well that seem to be forgot who owns or who elected them. Uh, so at, at, at this point, I am not willing to blame the Republicans for anything. They'll do what no. they do. I remember back in the Obamacare days when we fought for 
First, we wanted Medicare for all. The, the votes, we had 60 votes, a veto-proof majority in the Senate. We couldn't get Medicare for all. We said, okay, we progressives will just give in. Give us the public option or else. We can't give in, but we need a public option just to prove to the American people that the public sector is better for healthcare than the private sector. We absolutely know that the public option would have degraded the private portion of the thing. And we would coalesce into a Medicare for all by design and save the Americans money and save the American lives. Again, it wasn't the Republicans that stopped that. It was the Democrats. Now we go further now into Build Back Better. And we can talk till kingdom come. We decided to pass one using regular order and the other one using uh, what's known as uh, um, uh, reconciliation. reconciliation. Okay, we decided to do that. Fine. Who's stopping that again? It's not Republicans. <laughs> it's Democrats. So yeah. my contention is we are satisfied, many in the Democratic Party, not a lot or maybe not, not the majority, but many in the Republican Party are okay with having a sect of our population, meaning the poor and the left behind remain poor and left behind. Because all these policies that are the ones left behind are the ones that satisfy building those others back. Why is that the case, Mr. Weems? <laughs> well, I think you've, you've really... Um... Uh, you've articulated it because, you know, you look at look at a Joe Manchin, for example, uh, you know, you take away Alabama and Mississippi. West Virginia is, uh, if not at the bottom. And we're talking about education, infrastructure, um, you know, jobs, health care. Exactly. So his behavior uh, does not indicate to me that I mean, he's not doing this. Uh, you know, out of some obligation to his constituents. Right. And so you take a guy like that. And, and I mean, and it's it's pretty blatant, really. I mean, you got a guy with a yacht and a Maserati talking about, not, you know, um, uh, not one people, to, you know, the entitlement uh, thing. Right. And so, um, you know, I think, as you said, you've got a lot of so-called moderate Democrats that are hiding behind Joe Manchin and Kristen, uh, Kirsten Sinema that have um, very similar opinions about, um, you know, who gets to progress and who gets to benefit in this, in this economy, in this country. And so um, I just think until we get more people that are of a progressive mindset we're always going to run up against this. And it's like you said, it's not the Republicans that are stopping us on voting rights. It's not the Republicans stopping us on Build Back Better, which includes everything from health care to climate change. I actually wrote an article a few months ago and I found a quote from Manchin that was so, <laughs> you know, just objectively false. Uh, he was actually in a you know, one of these scrums that they have with reporters, he actually made the comment that, you know, he he's kind of looked at this bill and his concern is, you know, they're talking about getting rid of fossil fuels and that's not going to help climate change. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you know, what what scientist is he talking to? Right. So, you know, as I said, the, he is really, uh, I think, emblematic of what Democrats do to each other. And I don't know how we go back to the same people who who got us where we are now in terms of voters how do you how do you get folks excited now you know well, put more guys I, I, in do you know what i'm saying though how do yeah, you get them excited to show up at the polls notwithstanding the um you know just voter suppression that they're going to have to deal with anyway it, that is an interesting scenario right and i've been trying to answer that myself and I don't know that I have the best answer for it, but I, I want to pass something by you because I don't think, uh, you know, I, I don't think it is fruitful for us to talk about how do we get them to vote again. What I think is fruitful is demanding or, or asking them to, to, to vote again and support in the primaries 
those people that up that actually showed that they wanted to push this up and out. In, in other words, I want to tell them. I don't want to tell them to be depressed. I don't want to tell them to not care anymore because things are not going to change. I want to tell mm-hmm. them that they have to be the change agents, but that they have to build new alliances. And this is where I want to talk to you about um, how do we convince people? You know, I wrote a book a few uh, a few months ago called "It's Worth It." It's worth it. How to talk to your right wing relative friends and neighbors. My contention really is that. A lot of those people that we call right wingers, a lot of those people that marched on January 6th, they don't know what the hell they were marching about. <laughs> OK, they don't know how they're being hurt. And a lot of people say racism. And, you know, let me t- let me tell you something. I am I don't care who loves me. I don't care who hates me because of my hue. I don't. But I do care that that person allows themselves to be hurt by a political system that is snowing them because by them getting hurt, it also means you get hurt and I get hurt. Sure. So my contention then is not to complete, to demean the folk. My contention is make them an ally. And in that respect, I have had this new way of speaking. And I think I've talked to you beforehand on it where I try to let folks understand that, yes, I know that in a lot of these issues, the Republicans use the racist trope to have their people vote against their own interests. I want mm-hmm. to use that racist trope against them. I want to let their people realize that their folks are now making them slaves, what I call antiseptic slavery. And in, okay. and, in the, and, and the way that I've, I've started to, to hone in on that and I may need, not I may, I need help from everybody else, right? We need help from any, everybody else to, to, to make, to tell the story. You are one who can even make it uh, in, the, in the capitalist modal because of where you worked. You understand that the capitalization of our excess labor is what makes a lot of people rich and us poor. When it was that the slave owner used black folks, indigenous and others as slaves. They had to invest in their capital. They had to invest in their slaves. Their slaves were- Well, the slaves were property, you know, so yeah. Go ahead. It was like, it was, I'm sorry. It was, you know, for them, uh, just like, you know, taking care of a tractor, you know. Um, and what people generally don't think, I think it probably more now than in the past is that, you know, it wasn't just the plantation owner that was part of the financial chain there. You know, you got insurance companies up in New York that benefited, shipping companies benefited. I mean, it was the foundation of the economy, which because of, um, you know, just the awareness in 1619 Project and some other uh, writings. I think people are maybe more aware now than they were. But, um, you know, just to, to kind of go back to something you started off with in terms of, um, you know, the the people on the other side, right wing, if you will, that, you know, I have I live <laughs> I live in North Carolina, but uh, I live in one of the more I, I I can't use the word liberal, so I'll say less uh, MAGA uh, areas of the state. But even so, um, you know, when the election was coming, you know, so this time last year, um, you know, one of my neighbors has a 50 foot flagpole with uh, with a Trump flag flying. But when Trump lost, I haven't seen it since. <laughs> so, you know, he's on that. You know, he's not so crazy that he doesn't accept that Trump lost (laughs) on the other side, uh, just across the street. And and again, the reason I bring this guy up is we're very friendly. So what should I, you know, I don't know if this is where you were going with this, but I don't know how much good it does for me to, um, you know, be angry with this guy because he flew a Trump flag when we can have a, um, you know, a civilized conversation generally. Right. Across the street from me, there's a, a couple, and it's it really perplexes me because uh, the man, I would say they're maybe in their early 70s. They um, 
the the uh, the husband is, I guess, was born here, but his parents are from Italy. So, you know, these are not like, you know, guys that came up, you know, not hillbillies by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, Christmas rolled around. They brought us some homemade wine. I mean, they're nice people. And they have like this gigantic Let's Go Brandon sign or, or flag, rather, flying <laughs> off of their deck. And you're just going, what the heck? <laughs> you know, what do I do with that? Because now do they are they unaware of the total com, uh, connotation of that? Do they just think it's funny? I don't know. I but honestly, it just and I want to interrupt you there for one second. No, no, go ahead. Because I think you just you answered it. They are unaware. People say, well, not really. They're just racist. It's not just racist. I mean, I had I had um, uh, a, a couple of people discussing race, including Allison a few days ago, sure. discussing race and, and sort of making a point between racism and prejudice or whatever. What you've proven, I think, when you mentioned they bring you wine and that sort of stuff is that they see you in a different light than you exactly you right in other words you are there you earned your way there where you're living right now and somehow you may not be like the others because they don't understand the things that 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 we have all learned let's say from the 1619 project <laughs> redlining from all those things they don't understand how it made it and they don't understand that those that have made it the outside of that system did it above and beyond the average person had you been white. Well, and I, just to just to jump in, another thing I don't think they understand or they have a concept. And, and part of it is because I may be in the case that I just laid out, the only black person they interact with. Right. Most of these people don't have, you know, like we have, um, you know, we may have several um, white people friends that we interact with at work. And we've had to, you know, figure out how to navigate all of that, right? They have never really had to do that because right. everyone there around, with the exception of maybe me, is just like them or looks just like them. Right. And so they don't really have a, a grasp for, yeah, even though I live in your neighborhood and you think I'm a, you know, I'm a, a good black, mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't know that on any given day, the same uh, racism can hit me right between the eyes that could hit any person that you see on television that's been shot by the police or, or in, you know, any number of bad outcomes. They just don't realize that could happen to me. And henceforth, and, you know, I, I spoke a little bit to Allison about this and to a few other people, not only in Woke, but in other places. And henceforth, mm -hmm. the job that we have as with with platforms um i still have the contention that most people are good right i also have the contention that it is the system which have created and if you listen to there's a woman who talk about racism all of the times and she talks about there's not any there's not a race there's just a, the, the only thing is the human race and she's right and she explains a whole lot of these issues i can't remember her name right now but when i do i i'll put it out <laughs> probably with this article but it's it's important. To, and, and again, I, look, I'm not saying there aren't those aren't those people that don't want to be schooled. They are staunch racist. Sure. As they want to hold power. And that doesn't only happen because of pigmentation. Those are the same people who na naturally want to hold power over women, hold power over, 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 over hold dominion over others. Right. But <laughs> as humans, I think when when one explains the commonality. When one explains that it is a system that is that is enslaving their minds and with that enslaving them as a whole from a from a financial standpoint as well, I think it's easier then to make the case, which is one of the reasons I like talking to you and and others. And when I say talking to you, I mean, um, as somebody uh, who knows who unapologetically know who they are and it's not scared to confront all sides. Because at times we have hey, to Gerdor, I'm too old to be scared anymore because <laughs> at a certain point, it's like, what, what are you waiting on? Right. What are you waiting on? And I mean, honestly, when I first began writing, um, you know, you have a little bit of you know, consternation or um, what's the term? Um, uh, um, Hesitancy, you know. 
Yeah. And, and so, um, but I've gotten over all of that. And it's interesting with uh, my sub stack, the journeyman, um, I actually have, um, to my surprise, two or three paid subscribers, um, a couple that I know from, you know, my, my previous life in, uh, in uh, New York. I know they don't agree with me, but they still want to hear what I have to say because, you know, from their point of view, it's, um, you know, I make a good argument whether they agree with it or not. They, they sort of like the way that I approach, uh, you know, whatever the, whatever the particular uh, angle is that, you know, on a given day. And so, you know, um, why, why hold back? <laughs> yeah, I, I like what you said, because believe it or not, on politics done right, I have what we call the PDR Posse which is a group of a whole bunch of people that if you take a look at our subscription page, you see that we have hundreds of people that support the program. And it's interesting. And, and, and I've just started building a Substack base. Like you have a good Substack base. I'm starting to build a Substack base and a medium base. And a, I've already right. had uh, my, own, my own personal base as well. But it's interesting that a lot of the supporters, a lot of the viewers are actually right-wingers. Some of them utterly dis- disagree Others want to have an exchange. Sometimes they change their mind. Sometimes they say, what if, but, or whatever, but they're there. And ironically, one of my highest paid subscribers is a right winger. And he doesn't. I, I understand. The time. One of my very first, and I was, I was shocked. It was a, a gentleman that I worked with. He uh, had been, I think, previously an analyst at the Fed. So you can imagine, yes. you know, his conservative leanings, you know, from that, you know, that angle. And he was one of the first guys to, you know, to, to pay up. And I was yes. like, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure you've read what I'm writing? And, <laughs> you know, that that actually does, though, it kind of gives you a boost in the sense that, you know, you you. Uh, get a certain amount of validation, I guess, from, you know, and and uh, I, I think, too, it makes it, uh, I think it enhances your ability to uh, to have a discussion. Absolutely. So I, I think what is important is uh, when you when you make that cross, that that cross, I don't want to call it a crossover because there's still a large percentage of those on the right that won't listen to you. But when you develop a rapport with some on the right, I think what happens then is they bring others with them. And even if they don't bring mm-hmm. them to you, they bring a lot of the, the smooth in, if you will, of thought to others as well. So I think, I think that is important that there, there are people like yourself, what we do here at Politics Done Right, to make sure that we, we keep every single person included. We want everybody included because I think the way to get around at the, the, portion of the Repu- of the democratic party that continues to screw us all is to get a piece of the dem- of the republican base to help us bring the right folks into the fold to do the right mm-hmm. thing now um, we're running up on time here i always enjoy the discussion with you uh, marlon give me a closer so that we can end this thing but i i, I really enjoyed what what you had to say today Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, you know, in terms of closing, I guess uh, things that I am looking at in uh, the new year, um, you know, the the uh, January 6th committee, I just am keeping my fingers crossed that, uh, you know, that they'll make have some public hearings and put some things out there to really make people aware. Because I, uh, as we were talking about earlier, I think that uh, a lot of people, you know, they know the buzzword January 6th, but I, I just don't think a lot of the country is really uh, focused in on just how close we came. So that's certainly one thing. And then the other would be voting rights, because quite frankly, if we don't uh, address that and, and there's really no mystery about what needs to be done. And I, uh, I'm, I'm hoping against hope that Democrats will will uh, will do the right thing there, because if they don't, I'm, I'm, um, I showed her to think where where we end up. And a message to the voters for 2022. A message to the voters. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's sort of like you said earlier, don't give up hope. Uh, I mean, 
I'm certainly going to vote as many times as I can. <laughs> no, seriously, though, I'm going to vote. My my daughter just turned 18. She's excited to be able to vote for the first time. And, you know, a lot of people bled and, and died for us to be able to hold this thing together. And one of the things that, you know, one of my biggest uh, takeaways, you know, we're uh, in Woke having a um, a reader's group that's reading through the uh, uh, 1619 uh, book that just came out. And one of my um, uh, big takeaways is that, you know, Americans historically, or or African-Americans, I should say, have been the most American in the sense that we've believed when, um, you know, all the evidence was against us and we've, we've hung in there and fought for this country, you know, to, uh, to, to deliver. And so I think that's kind of a moment where we are now. Marlon Weems, AKA the journeyman, check him out at Substack, check him out at Medium. This man knows of which he writes. Thank you so kindly for having been on. (laughs) Thank you again for having me. Talk to you soon. You can get any one of my books as a gift for becoming a member of KPFT. Go to kpft.org, click that donate button, select Politics Done Right as the show you're supporting, and go into the gift area and select As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom, or you can also get It's Worth It, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors, or go to How to Make America Utopia, Take Away the Economy from Those Who Rigged It. If you get one book, It gives you one particular membership price, two books, you get a discount, and three books, you get an even better discount. So please consider becoming a member of KPFT, and in the process, you get the gifts of the books. You can get Politics Done Right Mondays through Fridays on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash politics done right, on YouTube Live at politics done right.com slash YouTube. Please do not forget to follow me on Twitter for updates. My handle is at Egberto Willis at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That's it, folks. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics and Right, and you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out. Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Welcome to Politics Done Right.